Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Between Two Fans. We are joined by a special guest in Maddie Hall, as Stevie P is on the touchline um, with the box currently, probably, you know, filling in at Scrum Off, perhaps even for Ireland. He's in Durban and, you know, going through a whirlwind of a time. So we brought in the big guns. Huli, how are you? Yeah, good. Cold. Uh, Cape Town is particularly blustery. For, it's been for the last couple of days, um, but good, good. Um, and yeah, excited to have a chat or chat all things sport. Indeed, indeed. So if you're new around here, we are going to be covering a um, bit of rugby, all the summer series, fixtures, um, a big deep dive into the Boca versus Ireland game. We're going to be jumping into the Euros. Um, we've got one semi final confirmed. The other one is about to start in an hour at the time of recording, um, and we'll discuss our thoughts on that. A bit of a discussion on the transfer window. We'll touch on Copa America. Can Argentina go back to back, and who will they face between Uruguay and Colombia um, in that final, as well as into the cricket, um, Jimmy Anderson's final test, as well as the new um, squad announcement for the Proteas as the test season looms large. And then, of course, we'll be touching on a bit of Wimbledon as the semifinals are confirmed for both the men's and women's singles. Moving on to the Olympics um, and Gayton McKenzie's decision to get rid of South Africa's superfans in Mama Joy and Bota Msila. Um, and then moving on to the, the flag bearers of the Olympics. And then at the end, the predictions of the show, which is how we'll end it, which is also how we are going to start the show. Really, it wasn't you, but I'm going to treat you like Steve because I'm going to assume you had the exact same, um, you know, frame of mind. But this is how this is how last week's predictions went. And if you're new around here, we predict three uh, of the biggest, you know, sporting games in the last week. Um, and then the loser, we're on a race to 15, Steve and I. And the loser has to wear an opposition shirt of the winner's liking. And who do you be pleased to know? Steve is a Man United supporter and there's Oof. no shadow of doubt I'm giving him that Arsenal shirt. So who is oh, an Arsenal fan, do. I'm sure. Please sure. Do. Yeah, I might, I, might, I might have to call you up to, to you know, send it up with the career guy up there to Joburg <laughs> um, and just, just let him wear it. So to get into Happily. the prediction from last week, um, of course, the big game was Springboks versus Ireland. South Africa going to win that one, 27 points to 20. Um, so box won by seven. My prediction was box by three. And Steve's was box by 12. Steve being five points from the correct answer. Me being four points from the correct answer. So I oh. just narrowly escaped with a, with a victory there. 1-0. Taking it to the so, Spain eh? versus Germany game. That ended 2-1 to Spain, knocking out the hosts in a, in a blockbuster quarterfinal. Uh, my prediction was 2-2, and then Germany to win on penalties. Stevie hit it bang on the head with a 2-1 um, to Spain, so credit where credit's due. He's got it exactly right there. And then Australia versus Wales. That ended 25 points to 16. Australia winning by 9 points. My prediction was Australia by 8. Steve's was Aussie by 10. So he split us down the middle there, the old Aussies. And, you know, I'm, I'm actually going to be quite gracious here. And I'm going to give this to Steve just because he's, he's it's, it's, it's a tie strictly. But he, he's hit one bang on the money, which almost never happens between us. So that 2-1 prediction to Spain to win, I think, gives him the win this week, which makes the scores 12 points to 11. I've narrowly got the one point lead now. So that, that, that hunt down to 15 is um, really heating up. But Huli, let's start by jumping into the rugby this last weekend. And I'm just going to blitz through some of the, the results and then get your thoughts on them. I mean, the big, big one, which was on, on Friday, was Samoa beating Italy. You know, a lot of talk about this Italian team. They, they managed to win that 33 points to 25. New Zealand, in their first game under Razor, just edging out England, 16 points to 15. No one really knows whether it's a bad New Zealand or a good England at the moment. Australia, as mentioned, winning 25 points to 16 versus Wales. South Africa, 27-20 to Ireland. Argentina losing to a B slash C team, French team, at home, 13 points to 28. And then a massive blowout win for Scotland versus Canada. Um, Huli, I want to start off with your thoughts on that um, England-ABs game, B 
because that could have been historic. I think it would have been England's third ever win, and they had the opportunity to do it again this weekend to get their third ever win. Um, that was, this last weekend was in Dunedin, but what are your thoughts on that game and, and just the shape of, of this Razor era and, and, the, and what's happening under Borthwick with England? Yeah, I think England missed the trick there. I think out of the uh, the series, that was the one to take. I mean, them having played a full Six Nations already, and and New Zealand really coming off of of very little rugby since the since the World Cup, if any. Um, so I think if England were going to take one of the one of the matches in the, the series, it was going to have to be that one. And I think they've missed a missed the trick. It was interesting mm-hmm. to see New Zealand under 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 Razor the the selections he made. Um, Demo at ten. Who? who yeah. Had what, what do you think of Demac there? Yeah, I mean, he almost yeah. he almost cost the team at the end there, right? He got he got buzzed out, having a kick to yeah. win it or essentially bury the game, take them four points up. Was, doesn't get doesn't beat the shot clock, but I mean, in general, I think he had a pretty solid game, no? No, he did. He did. Uh, and I, I think it's going to be very exciting. I think Razor's going to play an exciting uh, brand of rugby. Um, and Damo, if he gets that kicking for posts right, I think is going to slot in there quite quite, quite nicely, to be honest. Um, yeah, so whether we should no, be scared or, or what, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what, what's to come. Yeah, it's one of those already. I guess time will tell. And, and I guess one thing that you'll say for England, while they had all the time to prepare in their world, they didn't really know what they were preparing against. You know, Razor, known, although you've got a lot of, you know, um, Crusaders, um, you know, kind of history to work off of and have a, a good guess, you know, you, you can see the Crusaders' influence there and the likes of Severis getting back, you know, getting on the on the try sheet again. I mean, he, I can just imagine him mm-hmm. being a dominant force in that All Blacks team where he had kind of lost favor under under Foster. So, um yeah, I think I think it's it does go to show that this this England team has a lot to them. We saw that rush defense. I mean, jeepers, did did some of them put in some big hits? Um, Chandler Cunningham South looks absolutely immense. Mario Toje seems to be stepping up. There's there's a really real physicality that the English are now bringing to their game, um, and that's yeah. you know it's it's so obvious to kind of see that from 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 their defense that's that's come over straight from that book camp. Um, yeah, but I want to um, just move on to your thoughts on the the Samoa game and and then beating Italy. I mean, Italy, yeah. you would feel like after that Six Nations taking all the momentum out of you know, you know they just lost to France again because of a contentious um, kicking penalty um, that led to you know. Paolo Garbisi hitting the post and, and, and narrowly not getting that win, you know, blowing out versus Wales. Um, they had a really, really solid campaign there. You would have expected them to have gone away and got the job done versus Samoa, but not to be. Um, is that just yeah. away from home? Is it or, or what's happened there? Or is it just the Southern Hemisphere dominance? Yeah, hugely surprising that one. I must say, I, I saw the results originally and I thought potentially I hadn't seen the Italian team uh, that they'd put out. And I, I thought maybe it was a, a second side or, or, or whatever, but it really was. It was a, a close to full strength side. Uh, and and to go down to, to Samoa, who hasn't necessarily been, you know, front page as the World know, Cup. No, exactly, exactly. So very, very surprised with that one. Um, and I mean, the odds were were, were stacked in in Italia's in Italy's uh, favor as well. So I checked those, and yeah, it's surprising, I must say. Um, yeah. But yeah. yeah, I'm not sure. Do they, no, do they, they don't play I mean, again? I, I see Italy play love- Tonga, so they don't have. Yeah, it'll be be interesting. Obviously, you know, the, those kind of Pacific Island teams come. You know what feels like a, a pretty similar approach to the game, very free, free flowing, very physical, um, and and it will be a good matchup um, for the Italians. But they they'll have have probably had to catch a wake up and you know not resting on their laurels. So it'll be interesting to see how that one goes. I mean, they'll really go back home with their tail between their legs if they if they are zero from two. But let's Jeez, really dive yeah. right into what the the listeners want to want to want to hear us talk about, and that's the Balka versus Ireland. Twenty seven points to twenty. Just a quick recap wow. on the game. Aronser and Colby doing the business, getting a try piece. You know, Aronser, just the clinical finisher. Colby, as per usual, chasing lost causes at the end of the game. Um, you know, we've seen a lot more dynamic box 
now under the attacking shape of Tony Brown, um, you know, him quoting that, you know, Damien Delindy has been their best passer and all of a sudden he has been passing a lot more. Peter Stefter Toy is now, you know, running the ball a lot more, looking like a bit of a Harlem Globetrotter, um, just flinging mm. the ball left, right and center um, while still being a defense machine. I saw a stat that um, he completed 20 tackles versus Ireland, which is the fourth time a player has made 20 plus tackles in a match for the Springboks in the last 10 years. And three of those four times have been Peter Stefter toy once versus Argentina yes, in the rugby championship 2023 and the last one most recently in the rugby world cup final. So back to back, um, essentially, oh no, although he did, he actually played that Wales game. So not back to back. Um, and then of course there was a James Lowe kind of the highs and lows on both ends quality finishing, but blunders at the back. Um, mm -hmm. And then, yeah, a couple of calls that might have, you know, not gone Ireland's way and then finishing off with the penalty try. Um, I want to I want to just get your your, your high level thoughts on the game and, and, and what you saw versus what you expected to happen. For sure. Uh, I mean, it was it was quite an interesting game of rugby. I mean, there, there were so many talking points, uh, many of which you've you've named. Um, and one of the things that first kind of struck me was the the number of performances that that swayed from being really, really good uh, to, to to bad and like kind of back and forward. I mean, you look at someone like Pollard, who had, had such a good start to the game and kicked really nicely for poles and was banging everything. And then suddenly something switched up and. Yeah, I had to, to re-look at it. I thought, is that money up there? You know, I had to, to double Yo, check. I've um, never, I, like, I, there was one yeah. where he, he took it, I think it was on the, on the right-hand side from like the 10-meter line. And the frame didn't have the whole goal, goal post. It only had the, or Pollard's, fr fr from our view, the left-hand one. And he looked, I was like, oh, it's gone straight through the middle, not knowing that the poles were on the completely on the wrong side. I mean, we, yeah. we used to a, a Pollard. I think maybe we, we've become a little bit accustomed to, you know, a Pollard that just slots 100% of kicks. Um, turns out exactly. he's human. No, very, very odd. Uh, and that's, a lot of the strikes themselves just didn't look didn't look proper. So who knows? Um, but another one was obviously James Lowe, you, you mentioned. Um, and I think he's always in the thick of things for, for, for Ireland. He's been become such a critical player and someone that's scored yeah. so many tries. He's, in He splits the decision yeah. on James Lowe. People aren't quite sure what to think of him, both as an individual in public opinion, but also in skill set. right? Mm. Is he just, you know, yeah. one of those guys that walks in the hat tricks? Um, I'm of the opinion that he's, a little bit underrated and and he showed a lot of that but i think it, it looks like a bit of his decision making let him down a little bit this last weekend jeepers i mean i would i would almost go to say it was it was nearing on a disaster class from him but i mean then again i mean he scores a try he creates that other try i mean he does mm, so mm, much mm. so much good but those two moments that like the, the first yeah. one obviously keeping the, the 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 ball in whether that was out or not again is, yeah, is so yeah. touch and go maybe we'll touch on that a little bit a little bit later but then also yeah. one of the massive ones was the when when sasha came on um, and he took off. the kick yeah. off yeah and that kickoff Absolutely is going to land probably probably behind the try line. So the chances of it back, yes, it can well, bounce on back. On the line, at but least. I mean, the chances yeah. are, yeah, it's it, it's going to go it's going to go dead. Um, which is going to give them at that point they were five points behind. They're going to have a scrum in the mm -hmm. halfway line. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. almost advantage Ireland at that stage. And for him yeah. to to yeah. just touch the ball there is 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 very odd. I mean, I felt. Very glad for for Sasha because I mean that could have been a, a terrible could have been start. Destroying. Um, yeah, it, could, but it yeah, had that a weird game. Flipped the game. Had that flipped the game, and you know they actually got that scrum on the halfway line, being five points behind, got the try, scored, won that game. There's no one that no. Everyone's just looking at Sasha, right? You're just looking at him yeah. as the inexperienced lighty who's now made this error. And and essentially, listen, there's a lot that needs to happen between kicking the ball off the back and Ireland scoring a try, but it's mm. not unbelievable to think that it's that it's there. And just you can imagine you know that momentum type of shift in a era on the field. And Lowe was unfortunately on the wrong side of two huge ones and both being, yeah. you know, kind of these touch and go kicks. You know, Pollard <sighs> I mean that you could argue that his team maybe should have been aware that he was going to try that. Do they? Does he do that mm. in practice? Has he done that in other games? You know, was Colby just more switched on? I mean, there was that obviously Pollard yeah. going for touch with the penalty, and 
all of a sudden it was just Kobe darting it down. I was like, what the hell has just happened there? And he's yeah, obviously tried to throw crazy. it back in. I mean, I was surprised even that there was more than one camera angle on it because it's almost like one of those non-events in the rugby game where everyone switches off and is just yeah. really thinking about the line out, right? Um, but it just goes exactly. to show what the, 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 the temperament of um, the player that is chasing Kobe, that he does chase those oh. lost causes. And it's been said a lot, but... I mean, you, they're, they're saying it and then they're seeing him do it time and time again and making something out of nothing. And that's that's really what we're talking about when we come to like one percenters that he's making, sure. you know, that little bit of magic and you've got to give him that credit. Um, yeah, I, I, I think no, the other sure. one from Lowe, it's like there, there's that one percent chance of the kickoff that Sasha's ball bounces up and then it's like gets really ugly. Um, but you can see he's thought he was going to leave it and it's just like that devil on his shoulder just weighed large on him. And mm. he thought, no, I need to go for it last minute. He's fumbled it backwards, tried to get the kick away. Um, and had he got the kick away, he probably would have got decent distance on it. But it's just sure. the indecision is what's essentially let him down there. Um, yeah. But And I mean, that yeah. leads directly into the, the the penalty try. I mean, we, we, we get the exactly. scrum. Um, and I mean, the, the, the bomb squad had been obviously been on for, for for like ten minutes <laughs> yeah. or so, I imagine, um, with with not to great effect, and then, but I think that's the mm-hmm. whole thing about the bomb squad is it, it's not always necessarily that they're going to come on and the first scrum they're going to absolutely dominate, um, mm-hmm. but it's the fact but when that you're as at soon your as weakest, the, we the still starters, have that energy. Exactly, exactly. When the, either the opposition starters have fatigued to that level or their their subs have come on and their subs and our subs just mm-hmm. you, you can't mm-hmm. compare. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, well, yeah. I had, hadn't seen a scrum like that in, 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 in years. So that was, yeah, that was quite yeah. something. I mean, the biggest, it goes to show how the Springboks have really kind of reframed what a, what a bench is that the biggest mm. chair of the night was when the bomb squad came on all of our subs at once six yeah. or yeah, six men at once. It's, I mean, you got to be head in hands if you're island if you're an island front row and you're just seeing those oaks come on you just know it's done for and the yeah. size the pure size and physicality of you know just look at uh, uh, yes ach yes neyman and you you can just <laughs> you hear, have shivers down your spine um and yeah. that's a good transition for for ach here. um and let's mm. talk about that hit on craig casey some are calling it a cheap shot some are calling it a rug, rugby incident you know their previous teammates obviously are just a bit of a late hit on him post um, kind of him getting the ball back out from the ruck and essentially the size and, you know, two plus meter tall um, this of Arches Neyman against Craig Casey, who is literally half the stature of him landing yeah. on his back and whiplashing his neck and essentially um, KOing, KOing him um, straight away. You yeah. reckon that was a cheap Probably. shot or is he just laying the law? What are your thoughts on, on, on that debate? I actually watched it again today. It popped up in my feed and it was, it was an interesting one. I didn't, I'd completely forgotten about their, their time together at, at, at Munster. And mm. that really does kind of add like a whole new element to it because mm-hmm. at first when I, when I watched it, I thought he could have been in a little bit of trouble. Maybe that was purely from the result more than the actual action. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it was brutal. I mean, it, it seemed, it seemed very, it seemed unnecessary and I, I'm, I'm hesitant to use that, mm. that word because it, it, felt, it felt like, a, it felt like a, it, you, just because you look at the size, it felt very, like a bully in a playground, you know, yeah, like you're picking 100%. on the little guy uh, for, for no reason. And, but then, as you said, the action and the consequence do also still feel quite far removed. Like, Objectively, Arches Neyman probably does that to every player on the rugby field and they don't get absolutely smashed. So he's just playing a fair yeah. game. No, I think it's I think it's unlucky for um for, for Casey himself, just the way that way that it ended. Um but yeah, I I'm probably leaning probably towards a little bit more of a rugby rugby incident than cheap shots. But yeah, yeah. yeah the fact I mean, that they do and, and, also just 
Yeah, well, now now soon to be soon to be rivals with his move to to Leinster. So maybe it was a bit of a future laying of the law to say, listen, we aren't teammates anymore, neither on this field nor in the club rugby scene. Um, also, a lot of debate that followed that, which was of the Loftus DJ, um, you know, playing, mm. you know, brutally playing a bunch of songs and everyone getting their phones up during that. People calling it a bit insensitive. Um, I I mean. Listen, I think it's, it kind of falls into the same bucket as the, for me, the Russie song. And it's just, it's crowds and it's big atmosphere and people are there to yeah. like have a good time and they, they are kind yeah. of worked up and you need to work the crowd. You need to keep them entertained. They don't want to just kind of sit, you know, the, I think they had, they had only started that once he actually had started receiving medical attention. Obviously, you know, mm. had it been you know, worse than it turned out to be. Obviously, he gave the thumbs up as he was leaving the field. And the DJ yeah. did tell the crowd to give him a large ovation as he was doing that. Yes. So it's almost, it's one of those where, um, you know, it feels insensitive before you like see the whole picture. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I mean, the, the end story is he's, he's all right. Um, and then it was fantastic to see his, the, the thumbs up as he was exiting the the, mm, the field, mm, but mm. just just talking about DJs and everything. Did you did you hear the the, the anthem? Or have you seen that video of the uh, of, oh, of the anthem? Man, un, unbelievable! Yeah, just times. like the the best uh, peak peak yeah. South Africanness. I mean, I've got goosebumps now just thinking about it. Like the no, Hill of Vietni or Varons Vietni. It's just it doesn't get more Springboks than that like and the, the no. tone of this whole series was already set and whoever is head of production at loftus just take a bow and the yeah. lady that um sung the anthem take a bow you know drickers sure, coming out with the ufc belts like it, it, it would have yeah. been shocking had the irish won that game just with yeah. how much and how much knowing that the springbok players are motivated by the south african people in that setting mm. in Loftus, it felt like it was wow. impossible. But yeah, that, that anthem was was beautiful. Special. Yeah. Um, but I mean, also since that loss, Huli, um, or I can, because I have an Irish passport, but you as a South African mm -hmm. citizen can no longer um, enter Ireland, um, you know, without a visa you know, upon entry. So, you know, it looks like it might be getting political. He even, the, the, the person who announced it, even, even mentioning the, uh, the rugby game and saying how we have, you know, a lot of history, none more than the rugby. Um, I mean, mm. listen, it's, it's, it's probably not a rugby decision, but I definitely think there are a couple of people that are happy about it. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting old one, but oh, what can you do? What can you do? Yeah. Um, but I want to get your thoughts on the second game now, because we've already had Dan Sheehan ruled out um, with an ACL injury. Kerry Casey's obviously um, got, a, got his concussion. And the box have named their most experienced ever team with 990 caps um, and an unchanged 23, which what feels like it's been the, the first time ever. Um, what do you, what do you think Rossi's thinking here with this unchanged 23? Is, is there much to look into or is it just simply, you know, same, same formula worked last week. It's going to work again this week. Yeah, I think, I think Rossi from his press conferences has made it quite clear. He, the, almost the time for blooding young players and stuff like that. It's almost come to a, like a temporary end or, or maybe it's because of the, the magnitude of the, of the opposition that we've come against, but he's made it quite clear that he wants to win. He wants to win from now mm. on. He wants to win all games leading up to the next world cup. Um, yeah. More so that I think in the, in, in the past, the past there's been such a, a, a massive emphasis on, on, on trying to get more players or younger players involved and, mm. and, and, and mm. trialing different, different uh, options yeah. and, and combinations and stuff. Um, but I think now he's in and at the expense of results. And he openly said that. Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. And, and, and he also and mentioned also... a lot of the, how COVID affected his ability to be able to, you know, kind of bring in that new group, you know, losing a whole year and a half in the build up to the World Cup. Exactly. And I mean, I saw a quote from him um, in the newspaper today saying that he was 
like until the old heads start start dropping the ball and 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 start their their, their level drops, um, they'll continue to play because if they're putting on performances mm-hmm. like that previous, I mean, the, like the, the Irish game, then there's no real need to to, to make that many changes. Um, so mm-hmm. not 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 surprised that they we've gone unchanged um, and excited to see that group of players playing together again. Because again, we mustn't forget that before the, the Walsh game, I mean, we hadn't played any, any rugby as a, as a, as a national side since the, yeah. since the world cup. Yeah. So every game we play, I think we'll get better. Um, and I mean, yeah. you touched on some, some of the injuries. The Tony Brown influence. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so I, I think we'll continue to grow, we'll continue to get better. Um, so I think that, this next test is going to be probably yeah, even more exciting, maybe more of a level playing field now that it's being played at, at sea level. I'm not sure your thoughts. I heard a couple of mm, people saying, mm, why didn't mm. we play it at Ellis Park? Um, yeah, what do, you, yeah. What, do you, what do you think about Bombella. that? Bombella, we send it up to Bombella. Even, even PE, I mean, always Durban's, Durban gets a lot of flack for, for not having the um, best record, I feel like, both rugby and, and cricket. Um, at Kingsmead and 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 the Shark Tank, mm. um, but listen, the, it, everyone's saying it's a it's a foregone conclusion and and the box of one. I, I don't think that's the case at all. I think this is exactly when rugby teams have seen kind of rest. You you look at what um, happened to South Africa versus England, the massive hype for that France game. It feels just as big of a hype that it was before this first um, Ireland game. Look what happened to the Bulls versus Glasgow. They were told they were going to walk the final at home to Loftus. At altitude, that did not happen. Um, mm-hmm. th- th- this Irish team are number two in the world for a reason. They, they are a quality outfit. And there were you know, a couple of players that, that didn't step up. That if they did, I think um, you, know, you take those two massive James Lowe um, errors out of the game. And you know, Joe McCarthy, who can on their day be their best player, didn't really rock up to the first game and they still have depth in the in the category that they're missing the most in scrum off in in the you know they're replacing their two best scrum offs with someone who has over 100 caps for Ireland so they they have got those injuries and I'd say the biggest um, worry is probably in the front row um, and and whether they can you know still try compete for 80 minutes there and they probably just don't have that depth but otherwise, around the park, I mean, they they are matching Springboks um, number for number still, and and it's only going to be um, better if it's at sea level. So I think it's going to be a fantastic um, second game, and you know, it's one of those Ireland are going to be incredibly stoked if it's one one, they'll leave with that happy, and if um, it ends one one for the box, they'll be they'll be gutted. So there's a lot on the line. It's mm. not a dead rubber by any means. Yeah, definitely all to play for, uh, and I think that playing at sea level is 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 the massive uh, is is a big leveler. So I I would really warn people uh, against thinking that it's going to that it's a foregone con- conclusion and that we're going to walk it uh, because I think they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna come out strong. I think they're going to be fired up from a. a a dodgy performance from, from, from their side in the last game. Um, so regardless of the injuries, I think they're going to be coming hard. I think it's going to make it a great, mm-hmm. great test and a great, great spectacle. Absolutely. Huli, um, the baby box, unfortunately getting knocked out of um, the tournament we are hosting in a um, very muddy game um, against England. And they, they lost 12 points to seven as, you know, the, the, Baby box woes continue. Um, and, you know, it's so funny because we are lauded for our school rugby system, but never be, are never really, doesn't seem like we're ever able to really turn it up to under 20 level. Um, yeah, do you want to give us a little insight into what you think's gone wrong there? 100%. I, th- I think the the score was 12 17 to my if I'm if I'm not mistaken. I think they it was 12 yeah. 12 yeah. all for most of the most of the game and they scored really late on to make it 12 17. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one and I have also seen a lot online um a lot of questions there's uh I, I can't remember his name but uh, someone that's that's quite prominent on 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 X the platform saying you know how can we have the or claim to have the best uh, schoolboy rugby system if we mm. if we're not even making the the knockout phase of the of yeah. the under 20 world cup um m- my understanding of it is that is that South Africa rugby use the competition as a as almost a trial period um they they use it to 
to un- get, gain an understanding of of which players are almost worth investing money in and, and time into it. So you've got an example of someone like uh, Bruce Sherwood, uh, who was massive at schoolboy schoolboy level at, at at Bishops and got signed for you know signed for Western Province early early mm-hmm. doors. Um, and then had injuries and stuff like that, and there's there's you know, kind of people have almost started forgetting about him. They gave him this opportunity, and he potentially hasn't hasn't taken it. So what you'll probably find is that people think, like him. Another one is 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 Kun. Um, I don't think he put his, his his hand up, and I think that's very much what what SA Rugby uses it is we use it as this this trial period um, to really gain an understanding and give feedback to the union unions like is this guy worth investing in um yeah. so yeah i'm i'm not I, I would advise people against losing their heads and, and and about the whole system and blaming this person and that person for it mm-hmm. um because I, I i do think um we mustn't forget that we are our world champions we were world champions in 2019 <laughs> for the last eight years we've been uh yeah, we were, yeah. yeah. Last it it Cups, seems to so be I coming mean, right by the time they get to senior level, right? You know exactly, the, the, exactly. The, the, the system works, um, so I just don't think we should we should be losing our heads at the at the results. Of course, disappointing, but um, yeah, I don't think we should be be, be losing our heads. Yeah, no, it's not, it, we won't lose sleep over it. Obviously, you want to see all levels kind of do well cause just because it's exciting being able to watch these players. Um, but yeah, two losses mm-hmm. to Argentina and England, unfortunately, means we're out of that run. Huli, talking about teams that are out of tournaments, let's move on to the Euros. Um, and last night, it was France who bowed out um, in their semi final clash with what feels like now are absolute tournament favourites in Spain winning 2-1 goals from Danny Elmo and the 16-year-old wonder kid, Yamal, um, whose dad is younger than um, Yamal's teammate in Jesus Navas, who seems to be the last remaining kind of, you know, golden generation Spanish player from those 2010 glory days. Um, but they managed to get through. You know, I mean, for me... I think it might be controversial, but I, I think this France team are absolute serial floppers. They, yes, the Khan's argument might be that they've won a World Cup and they did blitz that World Cup and credit to them. But go back to 2016. They were the, easily the best team of the tournament. Somehow lost to Portugal, a team that was very average, largely just had a kind of Ronaldo carrying them and he got injured in the final. They won that next World Cup in 2018. Don't really go very far in the in the last Euros. Um, I don't even. I think they made it to the quarters. You know, this last last World Cup, obviously taking it all the way to the end in a final, Kylian Mbappe with the hat trick, but still not getting it over the line in the penalties. And now again, this is like being an. Ins- they it feels like every single tournament over the last what ten years they've rocked up as favourites and they've won one. You know, one from five yeah. for me in the with this type of squad isn't isn't enough. And and I've just seen that Duchamp has been given another um, contract. But I mean, I don't know. What, what are your thoughts? Do you think that's harsh, or or do you think that, yeah. that, that that's that's not not at all. I think they were incredibly poor. I mean, I've heard there's there's um, missing posters all over the all over the world. Everyone's looking for Mbappe <laughs> because he obviously wasn't at the Euros. Um, but I mean, gee, yeah, the, the stat for me that, that that blew my mind was the fact that they hadn't scored an open play goal until the semi, until, well, until the semi finals. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's one open play uh, goal the, talent, the entire campaign. Yeah, oh, with with the talent at their disposal, that just can't be happening. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah, very, very poor. Um, I thought one of the one of the better games of the Euros, which has is, is, is been an, an interesting, uh, I don't want to say dull, but an interesting old Euros. It's been dull. Um, let's just call it dull. It's, 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 can we call it dull? Okay. Like, let's call it bloody dull because it has been. You know, you know yeah. I've, I've been thinking about this a lot because I actually started out at the Euros and I was hyping it as one of the best tournaments because all the fans get together. But you know what it is? The group stage let it down. The group stage is where yeah. you get the three fours and the big ones. And then all of exactly. a sudden, some, some oak you haven't heard of shoots into the leading goal scoring lead. You know, there's a nice story with Georgia and maybe a bit of a story with Romania. But otherwise, like, yeah. the teams that have got through, like France got to the semi-final. They've been average. 
England have won one game in 90 minutes and they're in a semi-final looking to bag their mm-hmm. place in a final. Um, Netherlands are going to get to potentially get to a final having come third in their group. You know, the, 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 literally yeah. the two most interesting teams then met in the round in the quarterfinal, which was Germany and Spain. That was a great game. Yeah. But other than that, it feels like no one really has rocked up. No, I, I tell you what, I'm going to say give me F- AFCON. Give me AFCON. Um, give because me AFCON. people give AFCON a lot of grief. Um, and I think it has been much more exciting than this year's Euros. Um, may, maybe we'll get a really exciting game tonight. Um, Netherlands versus, versus England. Uh, but with... With Southgate at the at the helm, I don't I don't really know if that's going to happen. Yeah. Um, previous English English results as well. Um, maybe that also just does yeah. gives us a little a little place to go into there. Is what do you think about old Southgate? Do you think he's is he disrespected? I mean, I know he's got one of the best records as an English manager. I mean, he's got England yeah. to a a Euro semi final again. Um, I mean, is he disrespected? Yeah. Can you call someone disrespected? But then they. Just the style of football is just not what everyone wants to see. Uh, oh, yeah. What, yeah. Do you, what do you think? It's, no, I mean, it's. I think everyone can agree it's dreadfully boring. You know, I don't think yeah. anyone's going to going to disagree with that. The fact that they've won one game in ninety minutes and and I think scored probably five goals this tournament. You know, the whole time. That's with the additional kind of extra times that they've had. Um, you know, just scraping through against Switzerland on penalties. Um, and, and credit where credit's due, they converted all, all of their pens. But, you know, in, England's a tough one because the expectation is always so high because you know, well, all the players are the best players in the Premier League, arguably, and in my belief, the best league in the world. So you always have this insane talent pool coming through, yet they've never performed. So you juxtapose the best talent with under with serial underperformance at national level, and you don't really know what to make about with mm-hmm. someone like Southgate, who's kind of done well, got to a semi-final of World Cup um, and a quarter-final at the other World Cup as well as a final at the Euros and was a penalty away from being, you know, the biggest hero, like, had, had he won that. Um, but I, I think this is his last tournament, probably whether they win it or not. For me, I think I think that's just where they're at. I, I, and I think Southgate as well, to be honest. Like, there's only so much you can take from this British press and... Even if he wins it, I think what what better way to go out? Like, why wouldn't you then like hang up the boots? You, you know, he's probably aged twice as quickly in the last you know ten years at the helm of this team. You know, and it was really chaotic when he came in. I mean, he followed in the boots of Sam Allardyce, who was there for one game, so it, it was a chaotic situation. Yeah. And you managed to steer the ship and, and you know get really the English fans believing again after you know their golden generation completely underperforming. So, you know, you have to give him that credit that he got back on track. But, you know, there's also a point where I think England also need to kick on and realize that they still have that talent pool, that they should be winning things. And if he doesn't win, I think he should step aside. And and I actually think he will still step aside if he he does win. Yeah. Yeah. No, 100%. I completely agree. Um, And Julio, another tournament that's still going on, and a team that has been winning recently, um, the Copa America, Argentina bagging their place in the final, um, looking to defend um, their their trophy, which was Lionel Messi's obviously first international trophy for Argentina. Then went to go on and win um, the World Cup, and now you know make it back to back in the Copa America, beating Canada two 0 um, yesterday. Messi himself getting on the score sheet as well as um, who was it? was in the beginning of the game. Um, it was Alvarez. And um, Alvarez, yes, tonight yeah. there's a big big Uruguay versus Colombia game who are both red hot in form. Colombia, 27 matches unbeaten um, versus a Uruguay team that is very strong, knocked out um, Brazil and just chaos, right? You know, I think, I think um, you know, Darwin Nunes just typifies everything that this Argentine, I mean, not Argentine, this Uruguayan team is about. So, I mean, that that's blockbuster, right? Yeah, that'll be a cracker. Um, I, I, oof, it's very, very difficult to choose. I mean, it would be difficult to go against Colombia. Like you said, 27 games unbeaten. Um, that, that Those results speak for themselves. So, yeah, uh, Argentina definitely had a, a slightly easier run to the to, to, to the mm. final. Um, although it did take, Ecuador did take them to penalties. 
Um, but yeah, I think oof, I think that Uruguay uh, Colombia game is going to be a cracker. It's going to be tough to tough to call that one. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if I wake up tomorrow morning and I see four red cards because the, there can be fireworks between both those teams and about as passionate as players come. Um, and, yeah. and, and you know, um, they, they are willing to, you know, dive handballing, you know, thing the ball's way out of their goals if need be, if not, you know, chop 100%. tackle at, at the knees. So um, it'll be interesting. It's obviously at, at well, 1.30 my time, probably, you know, similar to your time. Um, but yeah. so I won't be watching it live, but excited to see the highlights for sure. Yeah. Hundred percent. I think if they either of those teams are going down, they're going to be going down to the fight, quite literally. Yeah, no, hundred um, percent. St- um, Stevie, not Stevie. We've got Huli on the show today. Huli, let's get into just quickly um, a bit of the um, transfer windows um, news, and we've got you know Man United looking to get a whole revamped defence, which has probably been needed for the last five years, mm-hmm. looking to sign um, Branthwaite from Everton apparently had a 45 million um, pound deal rejected by Everton for the for the proposed um, you know purchase of Branthwaite but also going in um, for De Ligt um, from Bayern apparently mm. Bayern fans um, you know putting up kind of getting people to to sign their signatures trying to keep him to stay um, they can't really understand um, why why they want to get rid of him this this young i mean he's still only like 23 or something years old granted he actually yeah. he, he i do feel like he always has a mistake in him but he's also there's still a big big potential there so it'd be interesting to see what happens um in that and then obviously your gunas going in for the mm-hmm. most italian gent um looking gent out there and calafiori um looking yeah. for for apparent, a supposed 50 million euro fee um are you, are you excited by that adding him to 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 the back row i mean gabrielle and and saliba have done the business but is this just your third one to to solidify that yeah i think he'll give us give us options there and i think that's that's what arteta has made um very important i mean you look at the, the, the at the arsenal back line with with white who who was a center back and now has been playing right back you've got timber who's mm-hmm. played 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 as as, as center back but then has also played as a left back and a right back i mean you've got uh, i mean has he played that many games to play in all those positions really or are you just talking about training pitches here Ah uh, no, he has, he has played. He has played a lot of games. Maybe not for for Arsenal as of yet. Um, but you got Kivio as well. Yeah. Kivio is a centre back. Yeah, that's been playing uh, no. left back as well. So I think it's a it's a very Arteta move, um, and, and and someone that will really really almost solidify that 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 Arsenal defence. Uh, mm-hmm. And with with all those options, I think it'll be, yeah, uh, tough to tough to beat. Um, um, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> looking to, to 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 strike back off of the, the past two seasons um but yeah moving yeah. on a big big move for elise away from crystal palace and and depriving us of what looked like it was going to be a palace team that could have made a european run because cheapest did they in mm. the season well but he's he's going off straight to europe um and joining Bayern munchen for 45 million pounds um and you know obviously a massive massive move for him i believe he has the option to represent england or france if he wants to you can kind of choose between the two because neither have actually picked um but that, that that that's absolutely massive but a pity to see him leave the premier league and then of course the yeah, contentious exactly. mason mason greenwood um looking to join marseille um and as man and i have looked to get him off the books obviously you know massively um contentious figure um, amongst you know all football fans, and this the 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 rumours have even brought up a quote from the Marseille mayor um, Benoit Payan, where he said it would be unacceptable if Greenwood ends up joining as a result of um, the allegations of his now wife of rape and sexual assault. I mean, it, it's a it's a whole chaotic situation. They now. I think I'm married with the kid. It's he went on loan to Spain last season. Now it's back won't be accepted back at Man United by the seams of it. And now clearly Marseille don't actually, or certain people at Marseille don't want to take him on. Um, just completely bizarre. But United looking to realizing that he's still the 
an insane footballing talent and adding on that buy-on clause, you know, 40 to 50% because I think they realized what the player he was and we saw got a, all got a glimpse of it. But it'll be interesting to see how that plays out um, for Greenwood going forward. Um, Huli, let's jump into the cricky. And it is stumps officially uh, at the end of day one of England versus West Indies in the first test and Jimmy Anderson's final test as an English player. He ends up with over 180 tests, unheard of for a fast bowler. Um, Just ludicrous. Um, But quickly to recap on day one, I mean, West Indies are for 121, a higher score from Mikhail Luis, uh, 27 runs, so pretty abysmal. Um, But the debutant, Gus and... Gus Atkinson taking seven wickets, um, 12 overs, five maidens for 45 runs. Um, Pretty unbelievable as far as debuts go. But I'll tell you what, he's robbing James Anderson of a a bit of a glorified running because he needs eight wickets to overtake Shane Warne to become the second highest um, wicket taker of all time in Test cricket, only behind um, Murrilitherin. So, I mean, now he's left um, Anderson the task of, you know, getting, I think it's, what, now going to be seven wickets in his in his final innings. Um, so a pretty steep, steep battle. Oh, if anyone can do it, Jimmy can, though, eh? Yeah, I mean, I mean, where, where, where do you stand on the, on the debate of him being the, the, the best fast bowler of all time? Oh, I think the the stats definitely talk for themselves. I mean, he he is an absolute legend of the game, um, and I, I I think I think you have to you have to give it to him. He, he he's been a, a fantastic servant for the for, for the, the English side and um, Jeepers. I mean, when you when you look at how he's maintained his body to to, to continue bowling, um, you know, that or keeping those numbers up for, for such a long time, it really is quite remarkable. So, yeah, without doubt, um, legend um, and, and, and one of the best to, to, to play the game, the game there. Yeah, I think the, the counter argument to that is, for me, he was always, let's call it top five. But I can't remember a stretch of time where he was ever number one and that he held that number one position. You look at like the dominance that Dale Stain had. It felt like I think it was like for three years he had that number one position and completely unplayable. And and yeah. the no one's doubting the longevity, but and 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 you know the way he's been able to maneuverable, you don't get, um, you know, 700 test wickets um, by accident. It's it's yeah. what he's done to keep his body in a place. He's just got that repeatable action, but also to vary it that people don't know how to figure you out still after all this time. I mean, mm. he's only doing it because he, he's got that juke ball and it swings like a beauty in, in here in the UK and, and he's able to kind of, you know, bring it back and forth. So, it, it, it does, for me, it doesn't feel right saying he's the greatest of all time. But as you say, the stats kind of do speak for themselves. I would just say that he was mm-hmm. never, ever the best at any of any given era. And I don't think that I don't think he makes the world best test team ever because yeah. I think at the peak of his powers, there were always people better than him. He just outlasted so so many. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's a fair, fair point. It, um, may, it, may, it may anger a couple, but yeah, fair point. <laughs> I mean, that's that's kind of what our what our job is to be fair. But moving on to um, the the Proteus um, test squad that that's been announced this week, and it is um, a pretty similar one to to what we've had. Let me just quickly run through it. We've got Temba Vavuma captaining, um, David Bellingham, Matthew Bretzka joining which if he plays will be his first um or his debut um test series or test cap um after a really good season with the warriors um nandre berger gerald katsia tony zorzi kesha maharaj adam markram vian Mulder being the big all-rounder of the group lungi and Gili, dane patterson being able to and dane pete being able to hold their spots after that new zealand tour um KG Rabada, Ryan Rickleton um, coming back into the mix, then Tristan Stubbs and Carl Verain. Um, 
yeah, who do you, I mean, any shocks there there for you off of that list? No, not 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 really. The main thing that jumps out at me is just I can't stop thinking about the the World Cup. Um, I, I know I know mm. you covered that in your your last yeah. pod, um, but just yeah, unfortunately, I'm excited and cricket in my. <laughs> that's where my mind goes we, 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 yeah, we shift focus see... we only ever cared about the test anyways we didn't care about t20s exactly. this is this is what keeps us alive we, we, we just we want, give us five days of cricket brew and even if it's at newton it's just the two days it doesn't matter just let the, yeah. let the boys wear white yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. uh but yeah it'll be an interesting test series after you're watching him um take on england as well so yeah, mm-hmm. pretty pretty stock standard squad, I think. Uh, but yeah, it's going to be nice to see the guys playing white. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's a it's a very young um, West Indies team. They had that shock win against um, Australia earlier this year um, in Australia. But you know, a lot of names that um, you know the larger kind of cricketing um, followers aren't very familiar with. So. You know, obviously, Branthwaite and their captain's been around for a while. There's obviously, you know, Jason Holder, Zari Joseph, who ha- have been there um, for some time. And then the, the exciting, um, you know, Shamal Joseph, Jaden Seals, um, you know, Moti, you know, bringing up like a really solid bowling attack. It's just whether they have it um, with the bat mm-hmm. to be able to keep out mm-hmm. um, the South African, um, you know, bowling attack, which is at the peak of its powers. But what it will be missing is the pace of Anrich Nokia. So mm-hmm. many people kind of looking at that list and thinking, where is um, the, the main man, Snorkia? He has um, actually said that he is resting and taking a break um, from Test cricket for the time being. He announces pre-World Cup, so it's not actually breaking news. But obviously, when you see that list, you, that, that's a notable exemption. Um, so, I mean, I have no doubt he'll be back. He obviously had massive um, injury issues and just made it back for the IPL and the World Cup and, and proved a lot of people wrong at that World Cup um, doing really, really oh, yeah. well. Obviously, T20 and Test format are, are, you know, very different, but to be able to see him, you know, clocking those 150 paces after the, the injury issues that he did have was was amazing to see. So, um, yeah, I mean, I just get so excited just for some Test cricket. It's, just, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. But... Keeping it in the present, really, let's go on to a bit of Wimbledon. And we are on to the semifinals mm. where we have got um, Musetti, who has just beaten Taylor Fritz to take on Djokovic. Um, and then, of course, we have a, ma- a mammoth clash of Karlov Alcaraz versus Daniil Medvedev. Um, give us your thoughts on what, what's happened up until this point and, and how you think this is all going to play out. Yeah, it's been a been an interesting old uh, Wimbledon as well. Uh, Taylor Fritz had that 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 massive game against Zverev as well. That went to Zverev being being two sets up and losing in five. Mm. Um, mm. One of the the most amazing games I've seen with just two players that are that are serving so big and so accurately. Oh. It was really quite a quite a spectacle. Um, Mazzetti beating beating Fritz as well. I watched some of that game as well, and yeah, Fritz just looked like he he, he got a bit in his in, in his head got a little bit frantic and wasn't able to kind of calm himself down um then you've got Diminor that's that, that's just withdrawn um mm-hmm. against against so he didn't big didn't, for jock uh, that's against... big for jock having having just yeah. come back from his injury i mean any time that he's able to rest a little bit more um you know versus his competitors at his age is only going to help right yeah. Oh, it's massive. It's massive. Um, and I mean, seriously unlucky for 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 Diminor, who who appeared to get uh, injured on in the very last point of the game. Yeah. So it looks like he wins the I point mean. and then he goes down holding his leg, limps to the net to shake um, Phil's the Frenchman's hand. Um, and yeah, it, it it looks really unfortunate for him because he was playing really good tennis. And I think that matchup between him and Jock would have been mm. a, a really enjoyable match. Um, but yeah, yeah, now yeah. Musetti against Djokovic again. Is this Djokovic getting a, a fairly easy run into the to, to the final potentially, um, and, yeah. and and to face the winner of Medvedev, uh, who who I hear Kyrgios calls the Slim Reaper, which I thought was was, was, was funny. Um, uh, and, he is a bit and, and Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, you, you, it was it was it's... actually fantastic. Um, no, carry on, carry on. Go on, on then. 
No, oh, I, I just was, asked. I, 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 the, uh, Curious was. Yeah, I mean, Kyrgios is actually he's actually unreal in in the press box, bro. I, I love him there. I mean, I saw that practice round so that good. he had with 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 Jock as well, bro. I, I'm desperate for him to come back. Say what you want about his temperament, but when he's on the TV, you bloody watch. Yeah. Um, but no, you know, exactly. I mean, I think it's also what, it's a bit of what tennis needs, right? Oh, 100 percent. I mean, just listening to him him commentate on the on on, on the Fritz. Uh, Musetti game was just so entertaining. I mean, he's got such a a level of insight and such a like a relevant uh, level of mm. insight um, that that's mm. just so mm. fantastic to listen to. Um, so yeah, I would love to see him back in the back in the game. When we will see that? If we'll see that, we'll have to wait and yeah, see. We'll see um, yeah. But 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 hopefully, huh? Yeah, of course. But as you said, it's 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 the big boys who are left, um, other than Yannick Sinner, who was knocked out by Medvedev in five sets. So you know, no one's really going through this in in in, in clean sets, other than Jock, who now actually has that extra break. You know, clean um, three sets um, versus um, Holger Rune um, to win in the round of sixteen, not having to play a quarter final. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and none of the other players getting it done in three sets, at least um, four or five. So I think that's going to be yeah. massively shaped and, 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 and might even just put Jock at, as the favorite. Um, I mean, Medvedev and yeah. Alcaraz are playing unbelievable tennis and you, and you can never write any of them off. But, it, it, you know, you, you're looking like a bit of an uphill battle here for Mazzetti. But who knows? Um, outside shot, everyone ruling him out, definitely possibility of of still getting through moving on to the women's um we've had um all the quarterfinals um played and we've got the semi-final matchup between krejikova um versus rab um right back right back in there um in the one semi-final which will be happening tomorrow and then um, Vekic versus Paulini. Um, but I mean, the between them, we've got number four, seven rank, number 31, and then an, an unseeded in, 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 in Vekic. So um, largely a lot of the big names are out that you expected to be there. I mean, last year's finalists of Swiatek and Onshabur, neither of which are there, Coco Golf out, Vitalina out. So um, it's, it's kind of, um, you could feel like anyone's game there. Oh, one hundred percent. I think a, a number of those 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 big names. Um, s- surprising that they, they they've been um, kind of uh, eliminated. Even today, Ostapenko went down, and as the thirteenth seed, she also would have been probably seen as one as one one of the favorites in the um, mm. in those that were left. Uh, but yeah, definitely anyone's anyone's game. Um, now that we're in the semis, for sure, for sure. Um, Huli, we're going to move on to the Olympics and to, to, to start off with, we have the announcement from our new sports minister in Gayton McKenzie, um, saying that it's the end of the career of the South African super fans, Mama Joy Chalker and Buta Msila, um, who were South Africa's super fans attending events like the 2023 rugby world cup. Um, uh, they, I recall they went to Australia um, for the Women's Football World Cup, um, likely would have gone to the Olympics um, for the um, for the Olympics now in a couple of weeks' time in Paris. Um, but just for the the World Cup alone, it appears that they have cost you know the South African taxpayer in the region of one point three million rand. And, you know, this big debate yeah. whether, you know, they are custodians of, um, you know, South Africa, they're, they're these, the, the flag bearers um, of, of the country and, and representative of, you know, having, you know, our support there and, you know, beyond just be, being someone to support on the field, um, you know, the with the TV, obviously, always kind of circling back to them, act as a almost like a, a tourism um, kind of symbol in, in, in showing kind of what South Africa is and about um, which side of the debate do you sit on? Are you, are you going to, you going to miss the super fans and, and Mama Joy or do you think, you think Adrian McKenzie knows what he's doing here? 
Oh, it's it's an interesting one, and I know you've got a you've got a strong stance on this, so I'll, I'll let you speak mostly. But I, it is it is interesting because I think a lot of people's opinion on the matter changed because initially you saw them at a lot of the the, the fixtures, whether it was the Rugby World Cup or, or or wherever. And I think a lot of people initially said like, "What are they? What are they doing there? How can you know uh, we be paying for this?" Um, but then it was almost that I got the feeling, and definitely what what my my own feelings were was that I almost became to to enjoy joy seeing their faces in the crowd and mm-hmm. I almost That's got that sense reality. that there was a little yeah there was a little bit of South Africa there um and mm-hmm. yeah I, I I so I think my opinion personally changed on the matter um it is it is a rather large sum of money that has been yeah. you know, used to, 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 to take them around so yeah. it's, it's difficult yeah. to argue against um yeah. but yeah what what are your thoughts because I know you were you, you were vocal on, on on X this week as well if I'm not mistaken yeah, I listen. My I was massively in, in favor. Hey, I, I, I loved seeing them at all the games. I thought they, um, if not, were the only South African fans at many sporting events. Um, for example, like at the the Women's World Cup last year, um, they at least then banded and were kind of you know the pillar that then brought to gain a couple of fans. You know, for example, at like Afcon where you know you we were largely outnumbered. And it kind of formed formed a group for kind of South Africa to get by. Listen, to to then for that to represent 1.3 million rand, you can't actually you know the, their representative and and role within these games is probably not worth nearly that much. And while mm. I think their roles should be kept, you can never be spending that much. I mean, what are you doing? spending 1.3 million yeah. rand who is signing off on these budgets for them to go and stay wherever they're staying and eat whatever they're eating yeah. and like what type of lifestyle is being lived so my there's for me there's obviously there's always the middle ground keep the people if not those individuals which would be sad but keep people with skills that can work for um the sports ministry people that have jobs that don't pertain to just on-field and in-stadium events. Have them working behind the scenes. They have an actual salary. Yeah. I mean, there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people that would kill to be um, either one of those super fans and have a high, have a, have a yeah. high skill set. Me and you probably, you know, I'll work for the sports ministry. I'll go to every single game. Bruce, sign, sign me up. up. Sign me I'll, up. I'll do yeah. whatever job you want me to for not 1.3 million rand. Um, so... I mean, obviously, that 1.3, it's not like that's their, um, you know, their salary. But it's a exactly. ludicrous amount of money to be spending. And I, I, yeah. I think there are a lot of people, the, the, people only got pissed off by the super fan is when they found out it was their money that was being spent. But no one gets angry exactly. when Gays and McKenzie's at the game, when they see um, South African ministers at the game, which is also taxpayers' money. They're also flying there on our dime. I'd rather Mama Joy yeah. be there than Gates and McKenzie. You know, so get yeah, get a mama joy day. or whoever the next mama joy is, get them a, a job that actually brings value off the field and then get them in the stadiums. Because at the end of the day, if we know they're bringing value off of it, we're going to love seeing them on it. Mm, 100% agree. Cool. Now we've got that off the chest. I've been I've been waiting to to use this, this, <laughs> this platform. We're getting a little worked up here, Rudy. Um, yeah. But let's let's jump into the Olympics and the people that will be in the stadium, 100% confirmed, um, barring any crazy injuries. But they've announced the South African flag bearers. And we're just going to touch on them and, and what they'll be competing in just to give um, the listeners a little bit of insight into the Olympics as we build up over the next couple of weeks. We're going to start off with the men's... Um, um, Olympics flag bearer in Akani Simbine. We touched a little bit on him um, last week, but just to um, continue that, he is going to be competing in the 100 and 200 meter um, sprint. He's previously finished fifth and fourth in the 100 meters at the Rio Olympics and um, Tokyo Olympics, missing out on the on a bronze medal by 0.04 seconds, which is a ludicrously, ludicrously small time, but in the sprinting game, actually not not that crazy. Um, so, yeah. I, I mean, you know, fifth, fourth, anywhere upwards from that, we'll take. Because, I mean, having a South African on the 100-meter podium would be insane, or 200-meter. Um, 
the next is uh, oh, the, the female the female flag bearer will be um caitlin ruskrantz the artistic gymnast um she was at the 2020 summer, summer olympics and was the first um, South African gymnast to qualify for the Olympics without a continental quota. Um, she represented South Africa at the 2022 Commonwealth Games um, in the uneven bars and won a bronze medal there and um, is the first South African gymnast to win a medal at the Commonwealth Games since 2010. So a lot of exciting um, prospects here for, for Caitlin and we hope that she can um, bring that form um, and that, that winning mentality from the 2022 Commonwealth Games to the Olympics this year. Then in the Paralympics, we got Mpumalengo Mflongo, who is the sprinter and long jump athlete. Um, he um, is a, and also a Paralympic record holder. He won um, silver and bronze at the 2019 um, Athletic cha Championships. But in the Tokyo Paralympics, he broke the T44-200 world um, record and set the T44-200 and 100 and long jump Paralympic Games record. Um, absolutely insane for him. And one of the, um, you know, one of our many unbelievable um, Paralympians and really fly flying that flag high for us. So we hope, and he says this is likely his last Paralympics, that he can go there and, and really um, not only wave the flag high, but um, bring home a bit of gold. That would be unbelievable. And lastly, we've got um, Kat Swanepoel, the swimmer, but the multi-talented Kat Swanepoel, who has also competed in South African wheelchair basketball and wheelchair, and is a wheelchair rugby player, which you inform me, Hudi, is known as Murder Ball, which, or previously Seriously? known as Murder Ball, uh, <laughs> which is just a, <laughs> a ludicrous name. Um, for those wondering, I was informed today, they don't play on grass, they, they play on a court. Um, but you've, all I'm saying is bring Murder Ball back, bro, because I, I think that, that you've got a hell of a cool marketing campaign waiting to go right behind <laughs> that, and I'll watch the hell out of it. Um, so maybe, maybe Cap will be a swimmer and a... A, a murderable player in the future for for the Paralympics, but um, I mean, she only took up swimming in 2019. Competed in the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. Obviously, only actually happened in 2021 because of COVID. But missed out um, on bronze, coming fourth um, in the breaststroke 50 meters. So hopefully, she can go on to claim um, again some silverware for us. Um, Huli, let's move on to the golfers. And there's been a lot to be said between live golfers and PGA golfers. It turns out that this rivalry extends outside of just, um, you know, individual and now kind of flooding into the Olympic scene. Yeah, very interesting. Um, basically, what uh, there was an interview with uh, Brandon Grace, who's, who's a live golfer, and and he's sitting there with with Louis Oosthuizen and Dean Burmester, um, and and when asked about the the the, the Olympics um, in which uh, Christian Benzadenot and Eric Van Rooyen will be representing South Africa, he stated that he thought that Louis and 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 Dean were were, were the better golfers um, based on current form and form over the over the last year um which again just kind of adds to this whole mix about the about live versus pga um mm -hmm. and and mm -hmm. it's actually it re responded on, on on twitter with the the big the big eyes um the big so eyes emoji, yeah. naturally yeah i don't think he, he he agreed um and also considering that that louis had an opportunity to to, to represent south africa at the at yeah. the 2016 yeah. olympics and 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 turned it down um actually yeah. dropped out last minute so yeah interesting one um but yeah definitely adding to that 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 pot of the live versus pga and, and everything that goes with it mm, mm, mm. obviously so the live golfers you know still aren't really receiving their world ranking points for the competitions they partake in at for live golf having only you know no cut only playing three days etc um it's never nice to kind of see it overflow to like the you know you always feel and, and i'm sure they do typically on the south african circuit at least it's like they you assume they put that aside but obviously you know the live players thinking that you know although they've gone there you know largely for the money and and, and absolutely not blaming them i'll do the exact same thing um but mm -hmm. you know they're, they're still believing that they are they are the players of choice and i mean for louis it's tough i mean he, he opted out previously and and 
won't really well, might i mean golf career is very long so he could you know easily have another actual opportunity but you know you don't know how many you don't know how often it's going to come around um and maybe it's just one of those where you're looking over your shoulder and thinking geez what could have been um pretty special thing to partake in the olympics even though you have these events i think uh, there's a debate whether these types of sports you know such as um you know football and golf should even you know tennis should even be at the olympics they have their own that kind of global platform but that's a debate for another day but yeah um we do have two golfers going to the olympics and and i think it'll be quite um i mean if anything maybe gives them more motivation to go out and bloody go and get a win you know just to just yeah. to stick it to them um even though it's your own country men um but let's jump into the the two um blitz booker teams really we've got both the men's and the women's who have qualified this year which is yeah absolutely fantastic that both have managed to uh to, to qualify i know they have they've both had bumpy runs in this year's uh seventh mm -hmm. circuit um so to have them both there at the, the olympics and, and and having an opportunity to 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 go for gold is is is, is fantastic um i know the, you know the blitz box squad or, or both squads have been announced um but but interestingly with the the blitz box squad um is that the captaincy i believe has changed Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, Siviwe uh, Soyuz Wapi has now um, given up the captaincy and or, or rather just been replaced um, with now the mm. experienced Selvin Davids who has been to one um, Olympic Games previously. The only player to have gone to two is Roscoe Speckman. Um, and so, yeah, they, they, they've announced their 14-man um, squad, including two reserves. But... You know they they got over the line versus England um, very recently to to gain that qualification. But I mean, and 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 we did win you know bronze at the 2016 Olympics with with the men. But when sevens was introduced, South Africa was the the force of of sevens, and it almost felt like this was going to be our thing, a sure medal every single at every Olympics. Mm -hmm. But I mean, looks like far from it. Um, at the moment, not taking a whole lot of confidence into it, but geez, maybe they can turn it around. I mean, they still, you know, they have experience there. It's, it's a new team and, and, you know, which kind of a pretty new coaching setup, but um, yeah, we, we don't have too many of the highest of hopes, but if they're, if they're there on the field, we're going to be watching with excitement. That's for sure. 100%. Yeah, and then and then obviously it's the it's the the women's sevens actually first time to to qualify, which is just epic. Um, having failed to qualify in twenty sixteen and twenty twenty, they did so by beating um, Zambia in the semis um, and Kenya in the final twelve points to seven. So, seeing the women's there is is awesome, and and it'll all be all of their first ever Olympics. And geez, what an experience that is! I mean, just the the, the pinnacle of of any athlete's career, which is which is um, yeah, so, so exciting and great that we have both the, the men's and the women's re representing us there. Huli, it got to that part of the show. We need to jump into the predictions, my friend. And it's you know, it's, it, it just depends. Do you want Stevie to take on and wear that Arsenal shirt? Or you know, do, do you want me to wear that Arsenal shirt? That, that, that's really what you're fighting for um, right now <sighs> and right here. So we, um, we've, got, we've got three fixtures of the week. We're going to go through um, Springboks versus Ireland, England versus New Zealand. And um, again, which is actually started. So don't you dare have a look at the score. Um, but England versus <laughs> Netherlands, you, the reviewers already know that score, so you will laugh at us when we get this prediction wrong. But Huli, let's start off with um, Springbok versus Ireland. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to count us down in three to one, and then you've got to say which team you think is winning and by how many. So, um, yeah, I, um, have you got a score in mind? Uh, yes, I do. I do. I'm confident okay. that I think it's going to be a, going to be a winner. Okay. Well, I, I'm ready when you are. I'm going to count us down now. Three, two, one. Bring box by eight. Box by 12. Okay. Big, big. So another, another close-ish affair, but box having too much for you, you reckon? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, I think those injuries won't wouldn't have helped them. Um, and I think 
just us playing another game with exactly the same team, I think we'll come out hot um, and we'll be able to to withstand a kind of a, a late onslaught to, to, to win by, by about 12 points. Okay. Well, if they do, I'll be absolutely ecstatic. I'll be ecstatic if they win by eight points as well, to be fair. Um, and then the big one, England versus New Zealand at Eden Garden, a place where New Zealand almost never lose. Um who have you got a score in mind for this one? I do, I do. Yeah, me too. Um, I'll count us in. We'll say it at the same time. Three, two, one. New Zealand New by Zealand 11. by eight. Ooh. Okay. Ooh, ooh, ooh. So we're both going for a, a more convincing win. Um, yeah. But um, so England don't don't have the stuff to get it done. You reckon? No, I don't think so. Um, I, th- I think, again, similar with the Springboks, I think New Zealand, uh, especially under Razor, are going to get stronger and stronger. Uh, and I think they, at, at Eden Park, I think they'll they'll flex their muscle a little bit and they'll be able to get over the line pretty comfortably against against England. Yeah, fair enough. And, and to be honest, I wouldn't be, uh, you know, it, it would be a, a massive upset, but I wouldn't be absolutely shocked if, the, if it did go the other way because I think England have that performance in them. It's just whether they can do it on the day and at Eden Park, it, it, it doesn't get any tougher. So, um, yeah, I'm in, I'm in the same boat as you. Um, England versus Netherlands. Maybe Gareth Southgate's last ever game in charge of the English in the Euros, the semi-final, um, started eight minutes ago. We don't know the score. Really, have you got a score in mind in your head? I'm, I'm between two. Uh, but I think I will. Uh, oh yeah, whichever one comes to comes to mind. Yeah, as well, I, as well. it, often it's just a split decision. Sometimes you make the wrong one and you realize it straight away, and it's too late. But it, it, sometimes it can end up, you know, being the the one that hits the nail on the head. Um, this yep. one we're going to say um, the score and then the team that wins. So, for example, I could say five no Netherlands. Um, cool. So I'm going to count us down in three, two. One, three, three one, one England. England. Oh, we've both got the okay. same same score, opposite way around. High, very high scoring. Yeah, high I, I, was, scoring. I was very close to saying nil nil and England on penalties, but I just <laughs> yeah. can't. I, but that's I can't like, that's football, bear though, right? to watch that. Yeah, no, yeah, I mean, least, basically this year, that would the, be the money the atmosphere bet. that that it's going to be at least exciting, but it's exciting just thinking about a three, one, either way, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's just, no, we, exactly. we haven't been treated to something like that for a while. Um, but yeah, I, I think England's days are numbered. Um, but to be fair, I might just hear some screaming coming out the window soon enough. Um, and, and hear everyone going crazy. So we'll see what happens there. But Hoodie, that brings us to the yep. end of the show. Thank you for your appearance on Between Two Fans. You are now officially um, one of these two fans. So thank you for that. And thank you to the listeners for <laughs> tuning in and, and welcoming Hoodie. Go, go tell us um, how you feel he did. You know, did, did he outperform me? Is he replacing Stevie P um, as, the, as the co-host? <laughs> you know, Stevie P prioritizing, you know, bloody Irish training sessions over this. Can you imagine? Um, but... Of course, uh, we'll be back this time next week. Same place, new things to speak about. As always, the world of sport does not stop and we won't stop speaking about it. So thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, Take care, keep warm, and we'll chat to you soon.